It's hard to believe that Christmas has already come and gone. Hopefully we, you had a good one. Yes, we do hope you've had a good one. And we are so glad that you are worshiping with us here on this last Sabbath of 2019. <laughs> Got some leaves yeah, on there. It's, it's winter, <laughs> fall for Southern California. And I know we're usually hearing a lot of different sounds, but today, if you can hear in the background, we're hearing a different one. It's. It's an, oh, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> One of the media team, Paul, has been flying a drone every single week, once a week, since we started building the building. Not too distant future, we're gonna be able to show you a complete time lapse from start digging the hole to a finished building. But that's all thanks to Paul over there. First, we have two announcements for next Sabbath. First off, we have Communion Sabbath led by Pastor Philip Miloslavlovich, and that will be first service and second service. I encourage you to come for that. And then in the afternoon at 4.30, Cheryl Van Ornum will be gracing us with a wonderful organ concert. Many of you know her. It's next Sabbath at 4.30 right here in the sanctuary. Please mark your calendars, January the 11th, we are starting a new series called Back to Basics. This will be just some of the fundamentals of our Christian faith and walk that Pastor Randy will be sharing with us. It'll be a three part, I believe, series. So put that on your calendar and we hope that you come out to join us. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, of course, check the bulletin, the website, the app. And as always, we love seeing you at the Uconnect Center in the foyer. If you are visiting with us, we really want to meet you out there. Have a fabulous Sabbath and a happy new year. We love you guys. Happy New Year, or, or is it Merry Christmas? 
Well, the truth is that as we enter into this particular Sabbath, one in which we inhabit a liminal space, perhaps the most apropos welcome that I can offer is Happy Sabbath. As we think about wrapping paper and the excitement of Christmas gives way to the expectation of the new year, I must confess that I am thrilled about our church in 2020. We will have the completion of a vision, a vision that is breathed by this congregation as we finally open our new worship ministry building. We also have the new addition of several people on our pastoral staff which will come to enrich us. And for that, I'd like to invite our senior pastor, Pastor Randy, up to join me here on the stage. Gracias, Miguel. Por nada, Pastor. Aquí estamos alabando al Señor. Por supuesto que sí. Ellos no entienden, pero no te preocupes. Cuando vayan al cielo van a entender. Así va a ser, porque el español es la lengua del cielo, ¿no? Absolutamente. Así estamos, yeah. Don't pay too much attention to that, but it's a privilege and an honor to welcome somebody special to our congregation today. This is Josh Jameson. Josh is the latest addition to our pastoral team, our newest pastor. We're delighted to have Josh here with us. Now, I have to tell you, this has been quite a journey. This is a journey that began, I don't know, many, many months ago. It began for me in a conversation with my son, Austin. Austin and I were talking about one of the dreams that we have had here as a congregation as we move into the new building, which you can see out that window, is starting a new service, a contemporary service in that space. It will not change anything we're doing here in the sanctuary, but it will add something. And so we've needed somebody to lead that, somebody to be the creative mind behind it, the deep heart and spirit for worship, for the worship of God in a new kind of style. And so our son Austin said to me, Dad, you have to meet Josh Jameson. So that's where the journey began, and it's taken a while. Believe it or not, we had a search committee. We processed his and other names. We invited him for an interview. We had a great time. We extended the call. He accepted it. It moved through all the conference committees, everything like that, months ago. This was probably back in the summer, Josh. And just now we're introducing him because Josh is from a land up north, Canada. Canada. And he had to get something called a visa. And that has taken a while. Who would have known that in this day and age, even between the U.S. and Canada, it takes a while to get such things. But here we are. Josh is here, and we're delighted to have him. Josh is our pastor for contemporary worship, and he will be leading us in this new venture. But first of all, Josh, we'd like to know a little bit about you, who you are, where you're from, and so forth. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Newfoundland, Canada, and uh, ended up moving from coast to coast to uh, British Columbia, and uh, I spent the last five years there serving as the worship pastor for a church, and now I have the opportunity and privilege to be here with you, finally. It's really exciting to see what Josh has done, not only there in Canada, which you can see online, but also back in Walla Walla as a student when he co-founded a worship service there that continues to this very day very robust and very vital. So Josh is going to be joining together alignment with our young adult ministry with Pastor Philip. Uh, the young adults will be key in what is unfolding there. So as you come here to this place, Josh, what, what excites you? I mean, you know a little bit about Loma Linda. Now you're here. What excites you about the endeavor ahead? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm really excited to be part of such an amazing church, uh, amazing congregation and staff. And I really think that God is really moving here at Loma Linda Church. And I'm just excited to be a part of that and uh, uh, just to get to really see what God is going to do here in 2020. Amen. Uh, Josh and I have been talking and corresponding about the ideas that have been born and the plans that are already outlined. It's really exciting. So just stay tuned. Uh, we'll be unpacking some of this and sharing some of this as we move ahead. But for today and for here and now, would you welcome Josh Jameson to our pastoral team? So how do we fulfill the expectations of 2020? How do we embrace the challenges that the new year will bring? I think about the words of the British poet George Eliot, also known as Mary Ann Evans, when she writes, 
It is never too late to begin to be who you were meant to be. Amen. And the Loma Linda University Church was meant to be a congregation of disciples deeply engaged in the art of kingdom building. So as we go forth, let the words of the prophet Jeremiah continue to instill in you hope for the future. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. Plans that you have hope and a future. So welcome home. Welcome to worship. Would you bow your heads with me this morning for prayer? Father, you said the light has come. And because of this light, the earth now can rejoice. And so, Father, this morning we rejoice with glad tidings, for you have come. But, Father, we also longingly look to when you will come again. Father, may our hearts burn within as we yearn to see you again. Father, I pray that you would fill this congregation with the Holy Spirit. Lord, may we be a people set ablaze that our light would shine forth, that this world would see you are coming. God, I pray that you would be with every heart that is here in this place that is sick with sin, sick with sorrow, sick with depression, sick with anxiety, sick with financial burden, sick with family chaos. God, we all are sick and are in need of a physician. And so, Father, I pray also this morning 
God, that you would bless us with the grace that you give. May we experience your forgiveness. Father, I pray and plead the blood of your Son over all of us here today. God, we need you. Father, I pray you would speak through your manservant, Pastor Randy, today. May we hear a fresh word from you. And God, I pray that you would touch every life with meaning as we walk into 2020, that it would not be the same year, that we would walk more faithfully, walk more earnestly, and walk more deeply with our Savior. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Last Sabbath was a very big Sabbath. That was our giving Sabbath. And it's of great interest to those who uh, want to know what came in in support of our new building. So Richard, um, will you share with us what happened last Sabbath and where that brings our total today? Yes, sir. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. We want to thank you for your continued generosity and support with this project and to this church. Last Sabbath, for our Giving Sabbath, we took in $330,000 for our special offering. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So with offerings prior to that and that have come in since that, we are now right at $800,000 for this giving season on our way to our goal of $1.3 million. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. We would also like to continue to... Uh, Thank you as we consider the fact that the year is winding down and we're headed into 2020, the year in which we will take ownership of this building and move into it. This is an exciting time. We look forward to it and we are anticipating great things to come from it. So we have an opportunity at the end of the year to give at our year end and many folks wait till the very end of the year. In fact, it's interesting to note that our year in giving often exceeds what came in on our giving Sabbath. So we look forward to uh, a conclusion, a wonderful conclusion financially for our building. Friends, we want to remind you that the church office is open on Monday the 30th, but it is closed on Tuesday and New Year's Day on Wednesday. So we encourage you to get all business done by Monday. However, let me remind you that you can throw your offering in the mail, and as long as it is postmarked the 31st, it will be included for that year. This morning, we also want to uh, introduce a brand new idea in giving. We have giving kiosks in the lobby. This is basically an iPad where you can go on and make an offering right there. And we just, again, want to say in all of your support and all of your giving for our new building, Thank you so very much. Yes, it is, it is, we can't say thank you enough. It is with humbleness and appreciation that we continue to tell you thank you. And it is an important part of how we feel. Um, friends, without you, we, we would not have this building. This building is for you. So without you, we would not have a need for it. And without you, we would not have it. So thank you. We are now uh, projecting that it'll be mid-March. But you know how that goes, as I hear some of you snicker, that it gets put off depending on the weather, and it gets put off depending on uh, projects, and every large project, project like this uh, has that. But we are projecting the middle of March, and we hope that we can make preparations to that end. Friends, we build this building for his kingdom.
Let's join us. Lift up your voices in beautiful harmony as we sing this a cappella together. something to talk with you about up here. Come on up and sit on the steps, but before you do that, grab that offering as you come down. Hold up that lamb's offering high, bigger people, so that they know where to go. Get back in the corners and the sides and the balcony all around, little ones, as you come down. All right, we're going to sing Away in a Manger as you do that. guys look so great. Who had a good Christmas this year? Oh, I did. I'm raising my hand high. That's awesome. Let me ask you another question. How many of you have a favorite stuffed animal? Favorite stuffed animal? You even brought one up on the stage. That's so awesome. Let me ask you another question. What type of animal is your favorite stuffed animal? What do you have? A wolf. Ooh, that's scary. What do you have? A lion. a lion. That's even scarier. You have a wolf too? Yeah, a, white wolf. a white wolf. It's like a pack of wolves up here. Oh my word! What do you have? I have a dolphin. A dolphin? A scrump dolphin, dolphin from Lilo and Stitch. Thank you for being specific. Awesome. What do you have? A penguin. A penguin. A dragon. A dragon. A bear, you guys are so brave. Whoa, what do you have? A big yellow bear. A big yellow bear. What do you have, sir? I have a, a turtle. A turtle. Oh, my word. So how many of you sleep better with your stuffed animal? <gasps> you do. Why am I raising my hand? Uh, <laughs> wow, you know what? Can I tell you guys a secret you promise you won't tell anybody? 
When I was your age, I had a stuffed animal collection. Anyone want to guess what animal was my, it was all one type of animal. What do you think it was? You are so correct. Did you watch first service on TV? It was a monkey. Oh, that's so awesome. Yes, I had a bunch of monkeys. I'd set them up all on my bed because I had to make my bed every day. Thanks, Mom. And I would set them all up, and I would swear some days I would come home, and I'd look, and I'd say, they moved. They moved. They're real. But I loved my stuffed animals. They helped me rest so much more. Did you know that Jesus said, and Pastor Randy's going to remind us today in the sermon, Jesus said that even though bad things happen, even though you might have a lot of challenges, a lot of, a lot of burdens in your life, if you have Jesus in your life, he helps you rest better too. And he makes those problems not so bad. Just like your stuffed toy helps you rest better. Well, today your church has a special treat for you because every single one of you is going to get a stuffed toy. Isn't that nice? That's nice. So I've got a bag here. Pastor Christian has a bag, and a bunch of people are going to try to help you so it doesn't take all service, but we want you to have this for two reasons. We love you, and the second reason is we want you to remember every single time you look at your new plush toy that Jesus helps you rest better. After you get your toy, you can go back to your seat. There you go. Which one do you want? There you go. Which one? There you go. There you go. I love seeing, love seeing all the kiddos up here. A church that has a lot of children is a healthy church. We're going to invite the Milo Savlovich family to come up and join me here on the platform this morning because we have another child who is going to be a part of what we're doing here in our worship service today. So I'm going to move down to this end. Just come right over here. You look beautiful. How are you today? <laughs> so, you know this family. This is our Pastor Philip, a young adult pastor. This is his wife and this beautiful child's yes. mother, Elena. And Milo Savlovich, thank you very much, is the last name. And we've come to, I, I've been picturing Philip, your daughter, on the first day of school when the teacher says, And what is your name? <laughs> She says, my name is Petra Rose Valentina Milosavlovich. <laughs> oh. That's good, isn't it? That's wonderful. And this is all the family back here. You've joined us here, and we're glad that each one of you is here today. May I hold her, Elena? Okay, let's see. Will you come over here to me? I'm going to put you right this way so you can see your family and you can see Mommy and Daddy. Now, they're taking pictures down this way. See right down there? Now, I want to tell you something, little Petra. I've known your mommy and daddy for a while now. I first met your daddy, and we don't remember exactly the day, but because he came to my office and wanted to talk about preaching. And we learned from each other, and we continue to do that. He's a good man. And then I met your mommy in a religion class for medical students. And she was a wonderful student, and I got to know her and have gotten to know her better. So there are mommy and daddy right there. There's grandpa over there, grandma back there, and the rest of the family. This is a very special little one. If you've been around Philip and Elena any time at all, you know that this is a little one who smiles and who laughs and who enjoys life just like her mommy and daddy. As I mentioned, Philip is a pastor here, young adult pastor. Lane is a resident up, up, up at the medical center. 
and they're an integral part of our family here at University Church. They love the outdoors. They love gardening. They love remodeling, which if you've driven by their house, which is not far from the church, you can understand that that's a real gift for them. I'll give you our address right after the service, <laughs> Philip. And then they had this precious little one, just 10 years and six months into marriage. So she waited a little time to make her appearance, but when she made it, what a joy she brought. Elena, she brings great joy to you, Philip, to you, to your family. You come with family behind you, family that we're very happy to have with us today. But there may be some other friends or family in the congregation who would like to stand at this time. We, oh, look at that. Right down front. Wonderful. Oh, all over. I see them just continuing to stand. Well, look at that, Petra. You have friends all over the place in this congregation. It's wonderful to see that. You may be seated. Pastor Phil, I think Mommy and Daddy have written something yes. that you would like to share with our congregation today. All right. Lord, we have loved the thought of this child even from before she existed. Yet, we know that you loved her even before time began, before she took a breath. And so, Lord, now we want to remember that she is yours and that she was yours before she was in her mother's womb, and that she will be yours into eternity. Amen. On this rock you told Peter that the church would be built, and so Elaine and I dedicate her to you and name her Petra, that she too may build the kingdom with the gifts and passions you've given her. Amen. Lord, make her kind, make her wise, make her strong and courageous, and Lord, help her to have no fear of man nor hell itself, but only the Lord. Amen. Petra, what we wish above all else is that you would be immovably set, deeply rooted, and firmly established in the love of Jesus, your Savior. Our prayer is that you would seek first the kingdom of God, knowing that all else will follow, so that we as your parents might be like the Apostle John and might be able to say that we have no greater joy than to hear that our child is walking with the Lord. Amen. And so this morning we dedicate Isaiah 28, 16 to you. So this is what the Lord God says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will never be shaken. Thank you, Father, for Petra Rose Valentina Milosavlovich. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Philip. And right over here is another pastor. Pastor happens to be Grandpa. Yes. So I'm going to hand Petra to you, Pastor, okay. and you are going to say the dedication prayer Thank for you, her. Pastor Randy. Absolutely. We appreciate. I uh, wrote a special prayer for you, Petra, as a dedication, but I will just give that to you. At this very moment, uh, the Holy Spirit is going to inspire me with the good words <laughs> that I can pray and I have baby dedication for Petra. Let us please bow our heads and have a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this precious gift of Petra that you gave to Elena and Philip. Oh Lord, uh, bless her. Let your Holy Spirit be upon her. Whatsoever she's going to achieve in her life, oh Lord, let above all that she can be faithful to you. I pray for parents, Alena and Philip. Give them a wisdom, strength, and your love so they can teach Petra in the way that she can stay all her life being in touch and faithful to you. Bless us as, as a family, as a grandparents. Thank you so much for the church support. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, Lord, in this moment, dedicating Petra to you, and let your blessing, let your joy, let your mercy and love be upon her all her life. And I pray, Lord, and dedicate her to you. And I pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Hey, you are jumping. <laughs> God bless you each in a very special way, and you, Petra, especially. Blessings.
Our scripture is from Matthew 11:25 to 30, or on page 1452 in your pew Bible. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Those of you who have joined us throughout this Advent season, and who have been a part of this series called The Sophisticated and Classy Art of Regifting, know that we've begun each week with an appointment. I left last week and had an agreement, an appointment to meet here on this stage this morning with Soraya Gupton Yanyas. So I'm wondering if Soraya, ah, here we go, right here. Come up. I'm glad to see you. Yes. Is it just you? Yes. Just you, okay. Yeah. No gift? 
Yes, we have a gift. You have a gift. Okay. It's in, oh, yes. looky here. Have mercy. This is a big gift. Yeah. Well, thank you. And who is this bringing? Is this Santa Claus? No, my dad. Oh, it's your dad. Okay. I wanted to get that straight. Very good. So you took something with you last week, didn't you? know what? I'm yes. going to sit down here so we can be a little bit more on the same level. At least you can look down. You took a gift with you last week, didn't yes. you? Yes. What did you take with you? A Nintendo Switch. A Nintendo Switch. Did you take it home and open it? Yeah. Did you play with it? Yeah, my mom too. Your mom did too? Yeah. What about your dad? Did he play with no. it? No. He didn't play with it. Oh, boy. All right. <laughs> we'll have to have some words with him afterwards. Yeah. Did you have a fun time? Yes. You liked it, huh? Yes. All right. Very much. So what were you, th oh, very much. What were you thinking throughout the week about it? <laughs> thinking throughout the week because my sisters really enjoyed seeing me and my mom play on the Nintendo. So um, I decided to keep it as a family game for wow. all of us to enjoy and play. All right. So you were just thinking of your sisters. I can understand that. Absolutely. <laughs> Very good. But you brought a gift, didn't yes. you? Yes. All right, because you remembered that the name of this series has to do with? Regifting. So tell me again. You told me last week, but remind me, what does regifting mean? Giving someone the gift that you don't need. That you don't need. Okay, I was waiting for that last <laughs> word. <laughs> I like that word. You scared me there for a minute. So, all right. That's a very good definition. So how about if we invite someone else to join us up here then? Awesome. All right, awesome. Okay, so we're going to invite Amelia Caravid. So where's Amelia Caravid? Oh, here we go. Come right on up, Amelia. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Come right up. Nice to, see you, nice to see you today. Do you know Soraya over here? Yes. You do. Okay. Is your mic on? I don't know. Yes, oh, now it is. it is. Now it is. All right, very good. <laughs> So you joined us here in this series, and you know a little bit about this series as well. Yes. Can you tell us what regifting is? <laughs> um, well, regifting is basically giving a gift that you think others need, or you know, thinking about others in other ways that right. they don't think they can. Very afford. good. That's very nice. And you know that Soraya made an agreement with us last week yes. to bring a gift. You, you knew that. Yeah. Okay. So were you happy about coming up here today? Yes, I was. Oh, very good. I'm, I'm happy you're here as well. <laughs> now, this is the gift. So I'm going to kind of slide it over a little bit this it's way. Heavy. And Sarai, you can come over here a little it's bit. Heavy, and Amelia, I have no idea what's in here. Could be a pony as far as I know. <laughs> so why don't you come over and see if you can open it here? Um, okay. and you, do it you will need... be heavy. She might need help carrying it out. She, okay, she might need help. All right, well, we're going to have Dad keeping an eye on that. Whoa, Sorry. now what is this? Can help. Oh, my goodness. Wow. We need to turn this around so that our friends can see what Amelia is going to re-gift to her pastor. Wow. <laughs> That is beautiful, Amelia. Do you know what that is? A hoverboard. A hoverboard. What do you do with a hoverboard? Um, you hover on it. And you <laughs> That's a good. I'm I glad you clarified that for me. What's that, Sarai? I got a hoverboard for Christmas, a metallic one. You did? Yeah. Not this one? Not that one. Oh, okay. All right. So are you happy with this? Yes. Well, this is your gift to take home. Wow. There's more stuff in there. There's more stuff in there. Okay, well, let's, let's see what, oh, look at that. Just what you'll need, a helmet. I even think I saw something else in there. Yeah, there's a lot What else more. did I see in there? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. And, oh, are those what I think they are? Yes, they're knee pads knee and pads elbow pads. And elbow pads. She needs wow. them, so she doesn't Perfect. get hurt. I'm not getting hurt this week. No, you're not. <laughs> Well, that's a wonderful regift. Thank you. Thank you so much, Soraya. Now, you're going to need some help, Amelia, yeah. so yeah. I'm going to see if, if you have. Do you have a dad over there, a brother, or somebody over there who can come and help? Here he comes right here. All right, Mauricio, I'm going to hand this to you. Now, this is, <laughs> this is for uh, Amelia, just to be clear. <laughs> now, Amelia, before you go, I have to ask you a question. What was the name of this series again? Regifting. Regifting. All right, I was just checking. Thank you very much. Now, Soraya, yes. I have something for you. Oh, yeah. Okay. I want to give you this. This is something that I think you'll enjoy. And I want to say thank you so much thank for you. being a part of this. Okay, thank you, and God bless you. 
So we've been wrestling with this concept of regifting. As you know, regifting is a cultural concept. Grew out of the popular culture. Had to do with giving away things that we really don't need or want. But our suggestion has been when it comes to the life of the Spirit, regifting is of the very best gifts we've ever received. Things like joy. Abundance, forgiveness, peace, and maybe even rest. The year was 1927. The place was Hollywood, California. A man who has often been referred to as the father of American cinematography was making a movie that year, a silent movie entitled King of Kings. It was a movie that was dealing with the final weeks and the crucifixion in the life of Jesus Christ. The man's name was Cecil B. DeMille. Anyone who has studied or watched movies over the years recognizes that name. Well, DeMille had an issue he had to deal with. He had to cast someone in the role of Jesus. So after a search, he found his man, found exactly who he wanted to cast in the role of, of Jesus. He found a man named Warner, H.W. Warner. Warner was a British actor, an actor who could step into that role and DeMille believed could do an exceptional job with it. But DeMille was concerned. He was concerned not just that he do an excellent job on screen, but he was concerned that Warner not do anything off screen to in any way damage the image and the impression he was trying to create about Jesus of Nazareth. And so DeMille had a pretty short leash, pretty tight leash, not only for Warner, but also for Sarah Cumming, who played Mary, the mother of Jesus. He did something that in our day and time would be virtually unheard of. He had both those actors, playing Jesus and playing Mary, he had them sign agreements in which they agreed they would not take any other film role for five years that in any way might damage their holy on-screen personas. And they agreed to it. They signed. But he was still concerned about Warner. And so DeMille said, in addition to that, this is what I need you to do, and this is what Warner agreed to do. You're going to stay separate from the other actors, you're going to ride by yourself to the set every day. You're going to ride there shrouded in black. You'll only be uncovered when you get there. You're to eat your meals alone. You are not to play cards. You are not to ride in a convertible. You're not to go to the beach. You are not, in other words, to do anything that might create the possibility that you would besmirch your holy on-screen persona. And Warner agreed to it. The question is, did all of that make him more Christ-like? Did he become more like Jesus? Well, the answer in a word is no. The truth is, it drove him to the point of utter distraction. The pressure built up within him, the load bore down upon him to the point where he couldn't take it. And many who write about it say it was during that time, during the filming of King of Kings, that Warner relapsed into his old alcoholism and would struggle with it for the remainder of his life. It was just too much. Too many expectations, too much of a load, too much of a burden. I can't act in all these ways that don't match what's going on in my inner life. He became a weary, burdened soul, all in trying to protect Jesus and to be like him. I suspect that Warner was not the only one who faced that. I suspect that there are people who came in today who are burdened and weighed down, struggling, overwhelmed. You wouldn't be alone. In fact, if we go all the way back to the time of Jesus, the world of Jesus, we would find people just like that in his day and time. I think over the years, I think over the years, I've not found maybe a better description of that than the one penned 
by the Old New Testament scholar, the old time scholar William Barclay, as he tried to capture the essence of the expectations that were laid on religious people in the day and the time of Jesus. Listen to what Barclay writes. Jesus said of the scribes and Pharisees, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. In ancient Judaism, religion was a thing of endless rules. People lived their lives in a forest of regulations which dictated every action. They must listen forever to a voice which said, you shall not. Even the rabbis saw this. There's a kind of rueful parable put into the mouth of Korah which shows just how binding and constricting and burdensome and impossible the demands of the law could be. And then comes the parable. There was a poor widow in my neighborhood who had two daughters in a field. When she began to plow, Moses, that is the law of Moses, said, You must not plow with an ox and an ass together. When she began to sow, he said, You must not sow your field with mingled seed. When she began to reap and to make stacks of corn, he said, When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it, and you shall not reap your field to its very border. She began to thresh, and he said, Give me the heave offering, the first and second tithe. She accepted the ordinance and gave them all to him. What did the poor woman then do? She sold her field and bought two sheep to clothe herself from their fleece and to have profit from their young. When they bore their young, Aaron, that is the demands of the priesthood, came and said, Give me the firstborn. So she accepted the decision and gave them to him. When the shearing time came and she sheared them, Aaron came and said, Give me the first of the fleece of the sheep. Then she thought, I can't stand against this man. I will slaughter the sheep and eat them. Then Aaron came and said, Give me the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. Then she said, Even when I have killed them, I am not safe from you. Behold, they shall be devoted, that is, given to God. Then Aaron said, In that case, they belong entirely to me. He took them and went away and left her weeping with her two daughters. Close quote. The story, says Barclay, is a parable of the continuous demands that the law made upon people in every action and activity of life. These demands were indeed a burden. Overwhelmed with expectation. Large list of demands. Requirements made of you. To the point where you literally just feel bent and bowed and burdened. I'm tired. Tired of this whole religious thing. I can't live with rest. Well, if you've ever felt that way, I want to take you to the words of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, the 11th chapter. They were read just a few moments ago as our scripture reading by Crystal and Sammy who read these words that I invite you to hear again, and I invite you to hear them as a soothing balm for your soul. Listen to the comfort that they offer. Remember that Jesus is speaking to a crowd that is burdened down, that is weary and heavy laden. As he looks at them, this is what he says to them. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Tired people, weary people, religiously weary people. And Jesus speaks to them. His invitation can be captured in four words. If you read the passage, four words stand out as directives, as invitations that Jesus gives. Come, take, learn, and find. Four words. Let's unpack them. First one, come, he says. Come to me. This is an invitation to a person-centered religion. 
person-centered. You see, religion can be based in and centered on any variety of things. It can be centered on behavior. That's the center. That's the core of it. That's what you have to have. That's what DeMille was asking of Warner. I want you to behave in all the right ways. You know that if that's the core essence of your religious experience, you end up burdened and weary. It can be centered on place. Certainly that was true in the day, in the time, in the world of Jesus. First the tabernacle and then the temple and later the synagogue. The place was extremely important. Place is important. But if that's the center of your religion, then once you're away from that place, your religious experience can be shed like an old coat. Religion can be centered in a variety of things. Jesus invites people to a person-centered faith. Come to me. What a balm of comfort and grace that is for someone who is burdened down. To know that it's just about developing communion between God and me. An old Jewish story tells the story of Mordecai, four-year-old little boy. Mordecai's parents were trying to be good parents. They wanted to teach him in the ways of the Torah, teach him the Hebrew language that was important to them. But little Mordecai was four. He wanted to do other things. He especially wanted to go out in the backyard and play on, on the swing that had been hung from the tree. He didn't want to study Torah. He didn't want to learn Hebrew. And so every day it was a battle, a battle of wills, a battle of who would hold out the longest, a battle to get him to learn and understand and repeat. Didn't want to do any of it. So mom and dad tried. They could, took him to the best doctor. What can we do? No answer. They tried other things. They tried exerting their will more forcefully, trying to get him to understand. Nothing seemed to work. And then they thought, we'll take him to the rabbi. Should have thought of that to begin with. And so they went to their local rabbi. And they said to the rabbi, he won't learn. He's not interested. We're trying to get him to do the right thing. We're try and the rabbi listened, and then he said... Just a moment. Mordecai was sitting right there. Just a moment. The rabbi walked over and picked up four-year-old Mordecai. Held him close. Pressed his ear up against his chest. Where Mordecai could hear and even feel the steady thump-thump, thump-thump of the rabbi's heart. And the rabbi stood. For a long period, in quiet, Mordecai nestled up to his chest and rested. After a while, says the story, the rabbi handed Mordecai back to his mom and dad, and they went home, and according to the story, Mordecai learned studied, and every chance when it was okay, he would run out to play on the swing. Jesus says, come to me. All these other realities have their place in proper perspective, but for you, Come to me. There's a word to describe that kind of person-centered religion, and the word is discipleship. Come. That's the first word. Second word, take. Take. Take my yoke upon you. Now, that's an odd thing to say, it seems to me, because here we're talking about people who desire rest. They're tired. And yet, a yoke is an instrument of submission and service. 
And here to the people he's inviting into a person-centered religious experience, he's saying to them, but there's something you have to do. You have to take the yoke of submission and service upon you. Now, we're 2,000 years removed and a half a world away from the world of Jesus, so it's possible that many of us haven't given much thought to yokes and what they are and what they do. Our media team has found a couple of pictures of yokes. Uh, They'll show them to you now on the screen. A yoke is an instrument like this that is placed on the necks, often of oxen, sometimes of donkeys or cows, often of oxen to help in the plowing, at times to help pulling a cart. So there's a picture of a yoke. Or another more makeshift kind of yoke on the necks of the oxen. It's an instrument of service, of submission. We say, but if we're burdened down, if we're weary and tired with all the to-dos of religious life, then why would we want a yoke? Well, Jesus says, faith in me, walking with me, is not a do-nothing religion. We each have a role to play. But what's even more interesting is this. There's an old legend. Some of you have heard it. There's an old legend. I can't tell you for certain it's true, but I think, in essence, it's true. An old legend that said that Jesus, as a carpenter, made the very best yokes in Galilee. During that period of the silent years between his appearance at the temple and later his appearance in public ministry, those 18 years when we know almost nothing about what he did except that he worked as a carpenter, according to the legend, he had a carpenter shop and his specialization was yokes. And that he was reputed to make the best yokes in the entire land. Someone even came along and said, that as is true in many shops where you have a sign above the front door, that there was a sign there that said, my yokes fit well. I don't know if it's true, but actually I know it's true because the yoke of Jesus of service fits well. If it is what He has created you to do and what He has called you to do, it fits you. And do you know that there's a certain sense of restfulness in your soul when you are about the thing that you were created to do? If that's you, if you're a physician and you walk away from 12, 14 hours at work and yet that day you have ministered to many, you have made a difference, you walk to your car, you are weary to the bone and yet there is in you a restfulness. Mm, this is what I was created to do. If you're a teacher and you have had that classroom of 30 first graders Scared the life out of me, it would. And you have spent your day doing all the things that you must do as a first grade teacher. And the end of the day comes and you just say, oh, I am exhausted. My feet hurt. My legs hurt. Everything hurts. I can't wait to get home. But as you drive, you think, oh, thank you, God. This is what I was made to do. Do you know what that is? That's when the yoke of Jesus fits well. It's what he's called you to do. It's what he's created you to do. And when they come together, there is a restfulness of spirit that doesn't come otherwise. Because Jesus is walking with you, and he's created you to do that and empowers you as you do it. Do you know, there's a word for that. And the word is discipleship. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Third, learn. Learn from me. Again, you say, well, how is that restful? How can I find rest of soul and rest of spirit when I'm in a learning mode? 
Well, be careful. Be careful to understand the right kind of learning. I love the way Dallas Willard, the late Dallas Willard, expressed it. Express this. He said, apprentice yourself to Jesus. Apprentice yourself to Jesus. Just go with Jesus. What he's doing, where he's going, be sure you're there and you're in on it. Because as you are, you will be learning. A writer, writer by the name of Claire de Graff, picked up on Willard's concept and writes these words. I invite you, writes de Graff, to apprentice yourself to Jesus, to become a student in the school of Jesus. Jesus himself, of course, will be your primary instructor. A few years ago, I spent a few weeks in Israel learning what it actually meant to study under a rabbi. Many rabbis in Jesus' day had disciples. In fact, that's how many of them made their living, as teachers. But their teaching involved more than information transfer. Rabbis typically walked out in front with their, out front with their disciples, their followers trailing close behind. As the rabbi walked, he would not only teach, but also stop and talk to people, buy things in the bazaar, conducting his normal everyday activities. His disciples were expected to closely watch everything the rabbi did because their goal was to become just like their rabbi. In fact, the success of a rabbi was often measured as much by the character of his disciples as it was the extent of their biblical knowledge. Jesus is our rabbi. To follow Jesus is to make the supreme purpose of our lives to become just like him. How do you follow your rabbi to learn to live like him? Start by reading the Gospels. And when you do, take your time, read carefully, observe him, mentally imagine yourself watching him up close and personal as he moves through the stories of the Gospels. When he speaks, assume that he's speaking to you rather than the crowd. Ask yourself, how would what he's telling me apply to my life today? So how are you learning? By following him around. Of course, you're doing it at a distance of both time and space, but you're doing it through faith, through the words of Scripture. And as you do that, you go where Jesus goes, you listen to what Jesus says, you watch what Jesus does, you observe how He interacts with people, and as that happens in front of you, you yourself are slowly being changed. To use His word in this passage, you are learning from him. Now from the, a commentary that is oriented toward Bible translators, listen to these words about this passage. The invitation of Jesus is, obey me. That is, take my yoke on you or take my task. Obey me and be my disciple. In fact, take my yoke and learn from me may, um, may be understood as the kind of construction in which the word and connects two thoughts that are equivalent. One can then translate the two commands as one. Learn what it means to be my disciple. So as you walk with him, you learn from him. You apprentice yourself to him. There's a word for that. And the word is discipleship. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, and you will find, that's our fourth word, you will find rest for your souls. Rest. Isn't that what we all crave? Anita and I love Christmas. We love the Advent season. I will tell you, we are relieved it's over. It is so busy. I know your life is just the same because I talk with you and I hear the same thing from you that by the time you come to this point in time, you say, I've got to go back to work, just be able to rest. <laughs> I've got to get through this Christmas season just to be able to rest. Well, Jesus is talking about rest, but not just specifically a physical rest. He's talking about a deeper soul rest. You will find rest. So just how is that found? Well, think about it this way. 
One of the most challenging and difficult experiences we can have as human beings is when our inner experience and our outer world clash and collide, when they don't line up, when they don't match. You've had that happen. Some of you have had that happen this Christmas season. If someone else had been able to be there and look at the gathering, maybe it was just you and your spouse or you and your family, if somebody had been able to look beneath the surface of that relationship, they would have seen down there a burning cauldron of emotions, anger and resentment and unresolved issues and lack of forgiveness and lack of grace. All of that's boiling down here. But it's Christmas. We're together as family. In-laws are here. Friends are here. And so up here, we're happy, festive, joyful. And yet, as you sit there, you can hear the carol playing in the background. Merry Christmas, darling. We're apart, that's true. And you're thinking, yeah, I wish we were. We're apart, that's true. But I can dream. And in my dreams, I'm Christmasing with you. If you have all that going on beneath the surface, and yet this is your outer world, and you're trying to smile and be happy, that's profoundly jarring, heavy, burdensome. It's the same with religion. When we try to be religious outwardly without having deep inner spirituality, the two clash and collide. Look at Warner. Cecil B. DeMille, act in every way you can like Christ would, but keep the heart you have. And he went back to drinking, couldn't take it. Healthy religion and unhealthy religion maybe differ in this. Healthy religion has robust spirituality inside, robust connection with God in a person-centered faith, and then the religious expression of that is merely the outgrowth of what is going on deep inside. And in that, you will find rest. But if you don't have that, and you're trying to put it on out here, that's anguish. That's hard. That's heavy. So when Jesus says, come to me, person-centered, take my yoke, it'll fit you well, learn from me as we walk together, he knows what will happen. There will be born within you a vital and a vibrant spiritual connection with God, which is lived out in healthy and much more natural ways. He knows that in that you will find rest. There's a word for that. And the word is discipleship. Now I think I know what you may be saying. You may be sitting there glancing down into your lap and you see the bulletin cover. Nice cover says the sophisticated and classy art of re-gifting. And you're thinking, re-gifting? I mean, I love the concept, and I love the concept of discipleship, but Randy, what do the two have to do with each other? Well, thank you for asking. I thought you might ask. So I prepared an answer. And here's my answer. This time, In Matthew's Gospel, in the 11th chapter, this invitation we have just read is not the only time by any means that Jesus speaks of discipleship in Matthew's Gospel. There are other times, and maybe the best known of those times comes at the very end of the Gospel. It's within just a few words of ending Matthew's Gospel. Jesus is making his last appearance before his disciples, before he ascends to his Father, and then he says something about discipleship. I'm going to paraphrase it. Use my words. Jesus says, this life that we've been living together, I want you now to go. To go. To go out there. To go to your neighborhood. To go to your dorm room. To go to your place of work. To go to the next city. To go all over the world. 
And I want you to make disciples. I want you to re-gift that discipleship. Re-gift it in every situation and every circumstance you can. Regift that person-centered faith, that concept of being able to serve in a way that fits. Regift what you've learned. Share the way in which you have found rest. And in that way, you will be regifting what I have called you into. And you will help them as they learn to walk with me as disciples. So if you're weary, if you're burdened, if you're weighed down with expectations, if the inner doesn't match the outer, if the yoke is chafing on you, if you don't know what you want to learn, then Jesus' command, Jesus' invitation is very simple. Come, take, learn, find. And then he says, once you have that, go. Regift it. Because when you regift it to them, they will find rest. Gracious God, from the adult lips of him who was the child, the babe of Bethlehem, we have today heard his invitation. Lord, we wish to respond. We wish to come. We wish to have your yoke on us, learn from you, and find your rest. 
And then, Lord, will you drive us out to share it with others? That we might characterize our church and our communities as places of true rest. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So glad to be with you again, and I hope you're having a wonderful year in season with Christmas and New Year's about to be upon us. And I've got a list of friends, and right at the top of my list are two dear folks, Marlene and David Coe, all the way over there in Alma, Nebraska. But guess what? They are marking their 50th wedding anniversary. And I'm here to congratulate you two. Your friends wanted me to remember you. Goldie Reese, right here at the villa in Loma Linda. And Goldie's having a birthday, and I want to congratulate you as well, Goldie. Blessings. Oni Himeno, also at the villa. Oh yes, we have quite a family at the villa. Marking a birthday, and Oni, I want you to know that we wish God's blessing for you, too. Hello, Vera Christensen. I'm always glad when I get to see you when I come around the villa, and I wish you every blessing as you mark a birthday as well. Helen Chung, I got to see you just the other day and enjoyed that hug you shared with me, and I wish you all the best at this season of the year for your birthday also, Helen. Hello, Vonnie Nelson. Glad to know you're a part of the villa family as well, and you're having a birthday, so congratulations. Hello, Ruth Carter Solomon, Pittsburgh, North Carolina. And wow, everybody listen up. Ruth is marking her 100th birthday. Isn't that terrific? Congratulations. And look at this couple, Minnie and Don Lowe. Their 60th wedding anniversary, and look, they are marking it also with a granddaughter at the occasion of her wedding where grandmother Minnie was the flower girl. 
for her granddaughter's wedding. Isn't that neat? Congratulations, you two. David and Sheila McDonald, all the way over there in Florida. I am so glad to be in touch with you people through the year and to know about the special events in your life. And here is congratulations for your 46th wedding anniversary. God bless you too. Hello, Cindy. Cindy Brown, over there in the Phoenix area. And to see you there with dear Jim and to know, Cindy, that it's your birthday. So I get to congratulate you. Melinda Yonke, what can I say? Up there in the Portland area. Yes, I've known you so long, Melinda. And when you were a little girl and I was a bigger guy, I used to call you my Linda, remember? And now it's your birthday and I congratulate you. Hello, Dr. Stephen Durangle, over Berrien Springs Way, and you're marking your 97th birthday. Congratulations and God's blessing on you, sir. And Ranajan Ruado, bless your heart, a part of our Loma Linda community, and now you're having a birthday. And with your family, I congratulate you. Hi, Bev Fletcher. So good to talk to you on the telephone the other day. You and Weldon now up in the Redmond, Washington area. And so glad you're there near family. And your birthday, Bev, congratulations. Hello, Don Farley, right here, a part of this Loma Linda family. And glad another year has rolled around so we can mark your birthday, Don. John Baldwin, wow, do we have history way back to Walla Walla University days. And I'm so glad to know it's your birthday and glad to see you there with Sylvia. Congratulations. Alfredo Kalbermater, a part of our family here at Loma Linda University Church, marking 95 birthdays. All the best to you, sir. Alvin Epperson, so good to see you and dear Margaret here at church, Sabbath after Sabbath, coming in your red convertible and congratulations on your 90th birthday, Alvin. David Stone, also a part of our family right here in Loma Linda, a teacher at Loma Linda Academy. We're so glad for you and your ministry and your birthday, David. Hi, Pat McGuire. Wow, do we have history also. And now it is your birthday. All the very, very best to you on your 94th, Pat. Hello, Alejo Pizarro. I'm so glad you're a part of our Loma Linda family as well. And your dear Mirtha reminded us it's your birthday, your 85th. Congratulations and all the best. And I mean all the best to all of us as we look forward to this week and a new year.